Hi, welcome to the Indie Wine Podcast. My name is Matt Wood, and this is episode 38. Today I'm speaking with Thomas DiBiase of Jupiter Wine Company. We sat down on a rainy day at the beautiful Idlewild Tasting Room in Healdsburg. Thomas and his business partner Michael Richardson started Jupiter in 2020 to not only produce low intervention wines, but to give back to the community. They work with a fun variety of Italian grapes, including Vermentino, Sangiovese, Montepulciano, and Tecai Frulano. Should really give the wines a try. We discuss the start of the winery, drink through and learn more about their vineyard sources, farming, and inspiration, and some about the Vegas tiki bar scene. Here we go. Yeah, I'm ready to. I'm ready to chat. I got okay. a. Yeah, I got a weird story. So I mean. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear the weird story that you have. Yeah, so I uh, was in my early 20s, um, and I uh, discovered wine relatively early. I uh, was like 21, 22 years old, and um, working in restaurants at the time as I was putting myself through school, um, studying economics uh, and staring down a career in finance. Okay. And uh, didn't, uh, never really felt like the right path. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I was really fortunate to um, connect to my, my father, who was a wine collector. And he had a, he had a really unique career. He started, uh, he was an oil chemist and then became a perfumist and then a uh, flavor scientist. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, food, okay. food scientist. Very cool. Doing like artificial flavors for like Snapple and Pepsi and all kinds of Gatorade and yeah. Wrigley gums and stuff okay. like that. And so like talking to my dad about that stuff was always really interesting. But then as I started to get into wine, uh, I started to drink it with my dad and uh, he had a different way of describing things, you know, you know, you would smell, a, you know, something would smell like, you know, orange or citrus or mineral or like, you know, the rain outside, like petrichor. And, mm-hmm. and my, my dad would actually know the, the chemical compound that was causing that, right? And oh, so he mm-hmm. would just kind of like regurgitate that. And so it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty magical kind of way to start. And uh, I, I went down the rabbit hole really quick and um, came out here on vacation and realized after visiting a few wineries that uh, I needed to come back the following year. And so I came out here in 2004 on vacation to visit some wineries. Yeah. And uh, as soon as I got back home, I started uh, reaching out to vintners and wineries and stuff uh, that that were looking maybe to ha- hire an intern or, or someone to work harvest and uh, and came back out and work harvest in 2005 and, and never left. Mm, nice. Uh, the first winery that hired me, I was one of the f- one of the first employees. Like it was like maybe the third vintage that they were producing wine was uh, a brand called Costa Brown, a oh, yeah. Pinot Noir producer. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so yeah, I worked with Mike Michael Brown and mm-hmm. uh, and Dan Costa. There was this gentleman Tony that worked there and Shane and we uh, we yeah we made wine. Uh, I made wine there in two thousand five, and then uh, was moonlighting as a psalm at a restaurant in the Napa Valley that just opened called Press. Uh, my, my wife now was the maitre d' there. She was the first, one of the first people I met okay. when I moved to California, which was, was pretty amazing. And I had this idea that like, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to produce Pinot Noir. Um, mm. And it's that's what I- big at the time. I it was huge like, at the yeah. time. I, I, I like to drink it. I was working in Napa, selling Napa Cab for a live, like making most of my money. And so I did, Making Pinot Noir seem like the renegade thing to do, and uh, really quickly realized that I was making a style of wine that I wasn't really in love with. Um, and uh, yeah, so I started a I started a brand with my last name on the label called DiBiase Wines. Mm-hmm. You can look it up. It was kind of had a little had its moment in the in the sun, and uh, but I quickly realized that I just didn't like didn't like doing it, and didn't okay. really like the wines that I was producing. Uh, most of the Pinot Noir vineyards in the Russian River Valley and the Sonoma Coast at the time weren't organically farmed. They were all conventionally farmed and nothing about the process seemed natural. You know, I, mm-hmm. hard, you know, I, I learned to make wine and, and this isn't, I'm not going to indict any, any winemakers that do this, <laughs> but like I, the way I learned to make wine was like sort of like square peg and round hole. You know, you, you farmed these sites that were warm for Pinot Noir and it was easy to ripen. And then you got the fruit in the winery and, and like, 
the first my first weeks on the job at anywhere that I, I worked, I was given the chemistry lesson of what to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, here's how you, you know, here's how much acid to add and adjust for pH and all that. Here's how to, you know, adjust, you know, bricks with water. Yeah, and and water here's, how to, yeah, here's how to acidulate the water and all this. And so it just was like very uh, disillusioning. Yeah. And so I kind of walked away from it and didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, started to work in the restaurant industry again and just... My wife was managing an Italian restaurant at the time in Healdsburg here called Scopa that mm. had a really talented wine director. It was just like killer one page wine list of like super minimal intervention, Italian wines really like captured the soul of like lo fi in Italy. Um, at the time, you know, there's these, these wines that are like natural wine darlings of Italy that are, are not made to be part of a scene, but more of like economic circumstance and, mm-hmm. Um, and, and also a reflection of just the culture that makes them down south, you know, where they kind of bootstrap everything. Yeah. And uh, so that was, and, and up north too in, in areas. And so those are the wines that I, I I was just drinking every night. I was obsessed with them. I, my wife and I were, were traveling to discover them and scouring the wine list here to learn okay. about them. And uh, so I, at the time, I decided that I wanted... Um, just to learn some discipline in the wine industry. So I started working for uh, one of the boogeymen of the industry. I started working <laughs> for, for Foley Family Wines. Um, and I was working for like large legacy brands like Lancaster and Chalk Hill and Roth and Sebastiani and like these are huge brands. And, yeah. uh, and so uh, the positive was is that um, I got to work with Bill Foley pretty closely. Um, okay. I got a lot of leadership training from Bill. Um, kind of got my head really screwed on right. And like, I wasn't ever inspired by the wines that I was selling there. I mean, I had an unlimited sample budget I could have like brought home and given away as much wine as possible. And over five years, I brought home zero bottles of wine. <laughs> but like, uh, for me, like I, I fell in love with the wine business for the first time ever. Okay. And I, I really like, I really understood it um, well when I was done working for Bill. And then uh, I got a phone call from a tasting room manager. My wife got a phone call from the tasting room manager at Idle Wild Wines. And mm. uh, at the time they had just opened their tasting room here. And they were having a little bit of trouble um, converting some of the the local clients on Piedmontese grape varietals grown in California made minimal intervention. Folks yeah. really kind of understand that. Mm-hmm. So I consulted for here. I wrote a business plan, um, put in a lot of effort, and uh, met with with Sam Bilbro, the owner. We went and had drinks with with Shariah, the manager here, was here, and. I just said, like, I was like, if you guys gave me the key to the Ferrari, if this was like a, a winery that I managed in my current job, I was just like, this is what I would do unapologetically. And it was like pretty bold. And uh, Sam reached out like 30 days later um, and uh, and told me that he wanted me to do it. And, uh, and this was awesome. a small brand at the time. And so it was very apparent that um, Sam uh, took out a line of credit to afford for me to be able to do it and have the opportunity to do it. And uh and I don't um, take that for granted. I mean, that changed my life that moment. And uh, so I started to work with, with, with Idlewild um, about five years ago. And uh, that was, I think, the, the moment that it all kind of made sense, right? Like everything that my, my passion for Italian wine uh, and, and the sort of like lo-fi sort of movement that was occurring in, in Italy uh, sort of conflated with my love of the wine business and it all happened here. And um, I think like we made some magic happen at Idlewild over the last few years. Um, yeah, and, and, and here I am sitting sitting right now uh, at, with, you know, with this like very um, supportive environment that we have at Idlewild. Like I approached Sam about starting my own small brand, Jupiter Wine Company mm-hmm. with my friend Mike and my wife, Danae. And uh, we, and he was very supportive. You know, he gave me the space to make the wine um, at Idlewild. Uh, he introduced me to... Uh, fruit contracts on Fox Hill. Um, at the time, Sam was managing Fox Hill. Um, Chris, there was some rumors of Chris maybe um, entering into the picture. At the time, he Chris was buying a lot of fruit from Fox Hill for for Brock. Right. Uh, but Sam was the one who was managing the probate because um, it was a it was a the 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 owner Lowell had passed away from the vineyard. Mm-hmm. Um, Sam introduced you know Ryan and Megan at Rhyme at the time were. Uh, making wine at um, the Idlewild facility on Hassett Lane. It was sort of a co-op shared facility. 
And uh, Ryan Glab uh, very graciously, you know, introduced me to Las Brisas Vineyard and 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 got us our first tons of Vermentino for our first vintage. Uh, we we have a different vineyard now, but uh, yeah, it was just a really supportive environment that we were able to jump in and like it just felt like we were we were boosted from the very beginning. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, but like we just had the we just had the support of everyone around us, and so uh, yeah, yeah, it felt really good. Good community, or yeah. Similarly. Did your dad's wine collection influence your taste later on? Were, well, were any of these tastes things you kind of yeah. recognized from his collection? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, my my pop, it, it's kind of funny because he influenced me so much when I was younger. And now at this point of my life and his life, I think I influence him quite a bit mm. as well, right? And so... Uh, he was always a, a big supporter of of California wines. Uh, he went through, like everyone, he went through the phase where like you drank these big, bold, robust wines. Sure. Um, but then to watch him abandon all of those wines and start to pursue, you know, things like Idlewild and and whatnot. But I mean, we had dinner last night and uh, we both geeked out over, uh, you know, a bottle of Ridge uh, Zinfandel from. Uh, green and red vineyard up oh. on Mount Vener- Beater, mm-hmm. which is like this like really magical place, you know, farmed organically since like 1972 or four. Um, green and red that that Zinfandel is is uh, is a unique is unique because it's been the house wine of Chez Panisse every day it's been open. Right? Yeah, I was just uh, going to I was just going to say that's the house wine, yeah. isn't it? And so yeah, it's the house wine. And uh, um, I I used to drink that wine with my pop, the Green and Red Charles Mills Zinfandel, when I was like 22 years old, and it was like 13.6 percent alcohol and very distinctive and 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 re- like ripping acidity. And then to be able to try ridges like very very demure um, interpretation of it from the 2022 vintage uh, last night while we had, I made brajola. So like stuffed oh, the, yeah, stuffed nice. beef with the breadcrumbs and the cheese and the chard and uh, the Swiss chard and, you know, simmered it in tomato sauce and yeah, polenta. And so yeah, I cooked dinner for my, for my pop and, uh, and we had that wine and it was, uh, yeah, it was like, I was 22 again, 22 years old mm-hmm. again. And I was like, I don't take any moment of that for granted, you know? And it's, um, I think that's like what is um, so unique about wine to me is it's just its ability to bring people together. The most interesting people I met in my life, you know, not just my dad, but I mean like who is also one of the most interesting people I've <laughs> met in my life, but like, um, but also, um, you know, just my, my dear friends that are you know, even like adult friends, you know, like it's hard to make adult friends, you know, like, yeah. you, especially if you don't have kids, like you're, you know, normally when you have kids, your, your kids' parents become your friends, right? It mm-hmm. happened with my parents. But as an adult, you know, you have to really make an effort and it's the wine has like brought, you know, so many interesting people in my life that have become like really close to me. So I think that's what, what keeps me really engaged today. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It is hard to make friends as, as a grown up, and it's yeah. great that, man, this wine smells good. How did you and Michael meet? That's a, uh, that's a great, that's a great story. So. And again, like another another weird another weird segue into uh, another subculture, right? So, um, uh, my wife and I are uh, we're certainly punk rockers, and so uh, where where the punk rock subculture goes to die is in another subculture called tiki, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, and, and you're you live in the Bay Area, so you understand tiki bars, right? Mm-hmm. And so, my wife and I love you know, like old cramp songs and stuff. And so we ended up, uh, our favorite, one of our favorite places to hang out is uh, this uh, lowbrow tiki bar in Las Vegas called okay. Frankie's Tiki Room. It's on East Charles, uh, I guess on West Charleston, uh, sort of by UNLV, by the hospital. It's in this really weird area of town, kind of, it's kind of sketch. And um, Mike was one of the, the original um uh, builders of the bar. So it was okay. him and a couple of two or three other individuals that built this bar. Um, and it's loaded with like lowbrow art, drinks, jukebox of like the best like surf guitar and exotica and mm. like really weird like garage and like punk and like monks records and stuff like that. And so we, my wife and I would hang out there often. We would just go to Vegas for a couple of days. So like just go hang out at the bar at, at night and like maybe like go to the pool during the day and like mm-hmm. it was just like this like place to like completely unplug and and just be weird and mike was uh 
Mike was behind the bar. And so Mike would, we would like, we got to know him. We would text Mike uh, that we were coming out. He would make like some cool off menu stuff. Like, cause he's this encyclopedia of these drinks going back to the fifties, like oh, of these rum drinks, right? Very cool. Yeah. And so he would make those. And so as we started to get to know him, he, uh, he was going through uh, the court of master sommeliers. So he had passed his certified um, or he passed his intro in as certified. And um, I think he was going to be an advanced candidate. And so the thing about Frankie's is that like a ton of MSs and advanced Psalms from the strip and Vegas, like there's just so many wine professionals in Las Vegas, they would all hang out at his bar. Oh, so they were like, okay. they were like ram railing him through the, the court, you know, like, mm -hmm. and so he was in all these tasting groups and stuff. And so like, we started to talk, I was like, wait, like you're into wine. I was just like, I work at Foley Family Wines. I was like, I have access to like any possible grape variety that you want to taste right now. And so, uh, so yeah, I started like sending them like all these, all wines and stuff to the bar, nice. you know, send them like mixed cases and stuff like that. And uh, so we started to explore the possibility of maybe opening a tiki bar in wine country. We were mm -hmm. like, yeah, like if all these wine professionals are like at your bar in Vegas, like, and you love wine, like you should be living in wine country and raise your, he has, he has two kids. I was like, you okay. raising your kids in Sonoma County and um, we'll open a bar, you know? And like, my wife was a restaurateur and uh, I was like, yeah, she can run the front for you. Like you can be on the bar, like. I was like, I'll do whatever is needed from a business standpoint to make that happen. And so we started shopping around real estate in 2019 and 2020. And we, uh, we had a lease in hand. We were about to sign a lease in Santa Rosa uh, in December of 2019. And uh, we yeah. got in an argument with the, we were going to buy all of the kitchen equipment like, and do an asset transfer, but there were these like... <laughs> And I, I thank God for these. Uh, there were these really ugly green velvet banquettes okay. that they wanted like $30,000 for. And we were like, we don't want the banquettes. So we don't want these ugly green velvet booths. And, um, and so we were like, we don't want to pay that. So we, we were squabbling over these, these, silly, these silly seats. And, it, and I, I got heated one day and, and I just walked away. And at the end, it was like right before Christmas in 2019, I walked away from the transaction. I was like, I was like, you, I was like, you can come back to me when you get these silly things off out of the, out of the deal. And it was like such a small, small thing to argue over. And then 90 days later, the world ended, right? Yeah, dodge, <laughs> dodge that bullet. Huh? Dodged a bullet, yeah, dodged a bullet. And so, yeah, everything that's been in that space since has, has struggled, you know, it's just like very difficult to come out of something like that. Sure. So then, so then we're in COVID. And, uh, and, you know, um, you know, myself and Sam were essentially the only employees for a long time at, at Idlewild mm -hmm. and trying to keep that going. And then, uh, you know, my wife and I are, everyone's kind of sitting at home, you know, baking sourdough bread and doing all the things that you do, right. Mm -hmm. uh, drinking too much. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about wine is that it's, it's really one of the biggest barriers to entry isn't just even financial, it's access, you know, there's just not uh, for like the really good fruit and the really cool fruit. There's just, there's just not enough of it, you know? And so in 2020, there was, uh, there was fruit, right? Like everyone had mm -hmm. a few extra tons or like a couple extra acres that weren't like spoken for. Okay. And so uh, it, there was this kind of opportunity. So I called Mike in like July, may, might've even been August. And wow. I was like, I was like, I, I have access to Vermentino and Montepulciano and Sangiovese right now from Fox Hill and Las Brisas. Um, the fruit costs are, are, are not expensive. It's a fraction of what I used to pay for Pinot Noir through 10, 12 years ago, mm -hmm. like less than a third. And so uh, I was like, I think, um, I think that like we were thinking about this wrong. Like we shouldn't really be opening a tiki bar in Sonoma. I was like, you should move here and make wine with me in Sonoma. I was like, I could teach you to make wine. And uh, I could teach you to make wine like in, a, in, in, in one year. And it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a, I was like, there's a lot to learn, but also like a lot of it is touch. And uh, it's, a, it's a craft, it's a trade, you know? And so, you know, I think one of the most important things in winemaking is like learning that you have the time to do 20 things, but like a hundred things have to be done in order to like get the fermentation done cleanly, you know, and, and with no intervention. And like, you just have to, 
you just have to really manage your time and and be willing to grind. And like mm-hmm. that's kind of making wine. And then like grape growing is a whole other viticulture and grape growing is a whole other thing. But uh so uh yeah, he was here like 48 hours later. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, we had a we had a spare uh we had a spare bedroom uh at our our home is super small. It's only like 900 square feet. We had a spare bedroom that Mike was able to crash in and uh we have we had at the time three crazy corgis that loved Mike and so they just slept with them and stuff. So like <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, um, it was, um, pretty, uh, it was a pretty wild time, you know, 2020. Yeah. yeah and we were right before, right before we harvested this, the first pick for us was Sangiovese and the 10, almost 10 whole days prior to calling that pick, uh, we were evacuated for fires. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we it's were another, yeah. Another twist on. Yeah. Uh, Crazy 2022. Crazy 2020. Crazy 2020, rather, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. we were, we were, and it was like, it was 2020, and so there were no vaccines, and my, yeah, my folks are old, and my folks ended up retiring. I was living in New Jersey, and I don't even know if I mentioned that, but I was living in New Jersey when I I was born and raised there, and my folks retired out here a few years ago, and so they were living in Windsor, just a few miles Hmm. away, Um, but like, when we were evacuated from our home, it's not like I could go stay with my folks because like I didn't want to get them sick you know because they're elderly and so uh we did we didn't know where to go there were no hotels available because they were all booked because of the people evacuated for fires and so we just drove down to the desert you know we were in oh okay we went to Joshua Tree because we were like you can't burn the the desert right (laughs) and so like that was we were like, because because it looked like we were going to be evacuated for a while and so they they kind of when they evacuated us they were like they told us it was going to be like it was a few days at least. And so we drove down to the desert and then um, drove as we were driving back up. Uh, yeah, at the, the day before that, we picked that fruit. We um, we were driving back up from the desert and then Mike was there the next day. Yeah, And then, yeah, right. he, yeah. he kind of never left either, right? He went yeah. home <laughs> to like sell his home in Vegas and move right back out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very exciting. Uh, so we're drinking some skin macerated, uh, skin contact Friulano uh, from a pretty cool vineyard called Las Simas uh, in the Russian River Valley. And so right off of uh, Sweetwater Springs, you off of West Side Road, you'll, you'll get onto Sweetwater Springs, mm-hmm. sort of like right where like Rocchioli, Allen, William Salyam is. So you go on Sweetwater and you, you head up, you know, to about 600 foot elevation and then you dip down on Vachery Way and then go up higher. Okay. So it's, it's like some of the highest elevation Russian, like middle reach Russian river vineyards that you can get. The marine influence is, um, way more like Guerneville, um, Armstrong redwoods, you know, the okay. wind whips through this, this site. So really cool, um, climate. The soils are really unique up there as well. Uh, chloritic sandstone schist mm. mostly. Mm-hmm. And so this kind of like Yorkville series, which is n- not, found in the Russian river, only up at this kind of higher elevation. Usually it's more that like Gold Ridge, loamy mm-hmm. yeah. soil. The vineyard is owned by uh, one of our dear friends, David, and he uh, replanted, I think it's 52. It was planted to Pinot, Cab, and Zinfandel. And most of the Pinot has been taken out um, and, gra- and butted over to 52 different, uh, mostly Italian grape varieties up there. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, Sam Bilbro from Idlewild. Uh, David was, uh, so David was a, a regular in the tasting room here at Idlewild. And he started to attend the uh, Italian wine classes that we okay. teach here called mm-hmm. Sunday School. And uh, after coming a few times and then like, he's become like a dear friend of mine and we've, we've traveled and, you know, just, we hang out all the time. And uh, so he, we started to help him with this, with this vineyard site, Sam really managed, Sam was the one who managed the, the replanting project. And so, yeah, now all of our friends are up there making wine with us. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty, pretty small blocks for 52 varieties. Yeah. They're all like or? three quarters to like one, they're all like three quarters to two acres. Okay. And so yeah, uh, not all pretty small blocks. Yeah. The goal was, the goal was, is to, I believe the goal for David was, is just to surround himself with the producers that he really respects and admires, mm-hmm. um, as well as start uh, a couple of his own um, 
own small brands as well. So he, uh, he's got this really cool, like Northeastern Italian grape variety project uh, that oh, he's cool. uh, going to launch soon called Communita. And uh, he also purchased, um, he's acquisitive. He, uh, he also mm-hmm. purchased a, uh, a really cool winery on West Side Road um, okay. called Armida which is like old school like Zinfandel producer that makes like some Pinot and Chard as well. And so we're uh, some of the, like the cab as well as the um, the Pinot Noir and stuff are going to uh, end up in uh, that brand as well. Okay. Which is kind of cool. Does Jupiter get anything besides the Frilano? Yeah, we actually, uh, we grabbed Frilano uh, from them. Uh, we'll also try another uh, wine from that site as well. We make a sort of our twist on a San Magdalena wine uh, with Schiava and Lagrine. Mm. And, uh, we also, our Vermentino now comes from that site as well. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. So the Vermentino that you tried at the Brock tasting, uh, was from Las Cimas, uh, and I can open one today too. Um, the, the, the fruit, uh, from Las Brisas, um, in Carneros, uh, in that kind of on San Pablo Bay mm-hmm. as like this really kind of like saturated kind of like Island characteristic and the Las Cimas, uh, stuff at that elevation planted in those soils is more like that mountainous Liguria where there's just like, it's like kind of like tastes like wine torn from rock, you mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. it has this, I don't want to say serious because both are like very serious styles, but um, it has that more, more earthen, um, that more earthen rock kind of flavor as opposed to that like real kind of like tropical saturated um, kind of chewy fruit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is it that you guys look for in a vineyard? I think, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think first, you know, the first thing we're, we're, we would be looking for are organic practices, right? Mm-hmm. Um, sustainability is this like wonky uh, term that is used in the wine industry and it's such a disservice to people. It's kind of like talking about cage-free eggs, right? Like, what does that even mean, right? Like mm-hmm. you could watch a million videos on like what that actually means and it's it's frightening, right? And so, uh so yeah, we want to actually see real organic practices. Like uh, we're not like mandating certification because we understand that like sometimes like spot treatments would need to be applied because you know sometimes with organic practices like you have to take the sledgehammer to the vineyard mm-hmm. um, with the organic treatment, um, which can wipe out like you know huge populations of insects and such. So like we understand like spot treatments and stuff, but like we want to see like we want to see like genuine effort in organic practices um, on the vineyard. Um, we don't want to see any like strip sprays. We would prefer not to see tilling. We would want to see like permanent um, cover crop and permaculture mm-hmm. um, with crimping. Uh, so like, yeah, certainly um, the practices are what we're really looking for. But then like most importantly, like it is looking at like what's planted there and uh, what you're trying to to produce from there and like looking around and and asking yourself the question is like, does this does this look like where this is grown, you know, mm-hmm. in its homeland, right? Okay. Like, does like, if I'm like somewhere that's growing like Frilano or Schiava and La Grine, like, do you look around and does it feel like you're in Colio Berta, right? Does this feel like the Suturol, right? Like, mm-hmm. is it mountainous? Is there, are there some, are, are there snow capped mountains, you know, in the winter and the spring, right? Um, you know, are the, the winds, uh, the similar, you know, like, do you get those, those crazy winds up like on top of Las Cimas that you would find like, you know, towards sunset and the Colio, right? Like, you know, does it, does it feel right? You know, um, I, I don't quite understand, um, you know, vineyards that, um, are like vineyard Italy, right. Where you'll have like with the, with a couple of exceptions, but even then, like, um, like a couple of times, like Fox Hill would be an exception, right? But like, even then on like on a vineyard like that, where you have stuff from the South all the way up to the North, like there are just certain grape varieties that like really speak like soulfully, right? And so mm-hmm. like for me, Fox Hill, like the middle of Italy and the South of Italy, like speaks like really correctly. Um, we get great Piedmontese grape varieties off that site as well. But like the middle of Italy seems to like really shine in that situation. Mm-hmm. Whereas like at Las Cimas, primarily everything that's planted there is um, is Northern Italian um, with some like Alpine fr- French as well. There's like some Mondus and stuff. Sure. But uh, mostly it's all fr- Friuli, um, Alto Adige, Trentino, like kind of those Sutral grapes, uh, Piedmont. Uh, and then there's this small pocket 
that is sort of this like little like heat sink on the vineyard. It's like a little bowl. Mm -hmm. And then there's mm -hmm. some, uh, the, some Campania whites okay. there to soak up the sun. But, and, but otherwise, yeah, like when you're in that, when you're in that vineyard, like it kind of feels, it's more of a feeling, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. So one of your goals is kind of to stick with something that feels similar to its ancestral home. Yeah, exactly. To the That's where I think like varietal correctness really comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, mm -hmm. obviously we're making like California wines, but like, I, I definitely want there to be the sense that like, when, when you drink our wines from Jupiter, like that you're enjoying there, there, there's this kind of through line to, you know, the really soulful, um, low intervention wines of, of Italy and where they're from. Yeah. There's always the muse, right. That like the wine that you're like obsessed with that, like you like that. Yeah. You cra you're kind of crafting to, mm -hmm. to attain. Yeah. How would you describe the Jupiter style? Um, yeah, the Jupiter style is, uh, I think I, wines that I really enjoy. Um, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate structure in wines. Like I would like there to be a lot of acidity. I like there to be, um, tannin, um, and like a really good kind of backbone of tannin when they're supposed to be. But for me, like wines become really exciting and really playful when the edges become a little bit blurry, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, uh, the, where the fruit sort of gets a little bit saturated on the edges. Um, and that usually comes from, in, in my opinion, it comes from, you know, picking ripe fruit, um, but also like fruit that's really healthy with the correct pH, you know? And mm -hmm. so having the, the, having there be life in the fruit when it's picked. Um, and then for us, it's, uh, and we're not dogmatic about this because there are instances where we would add sulfur, um, at different points of the process. But for us, it's um, making things not prescriptively, right? Yeah. And so uh, uh, skin maceration in the white wines for me is, uh, is very important. Um, all of our wines see some, some time on skins. Yeah. Uh, the skin contact free Lana that we're enjoying right now um, was de-stemmed, but then it spends uh, the entirety of the fermentation on skins. It's pressed at dryness. Uh, our Vermentino, and we also make Bianchetta, Triviniana, um, the Bianchetta spends 24 hours on skins. Our Vermentino okay. always spends 48 hours on skins uh, to extract those essential oils out of the skins, uh, draniol, linalool, things that are like really expressive and aromatic. When you go direct to press, most of that often will remain in the skins. And so mm -hmm. for us, like just getting those, those edges a little bit blurrier, we're like, it seems like the, the aromatics are like tuned up a little bit, right? Um, it seems like the fruit flavors are pressed down like a little bit harder. Um, and so I think, uh, that skin maceration in the whites, um, does that. I think also, um, trying, making your honest effort to, um, get the wines through primary and secondary without adding any sulfur, okay. I think is another, um, is another like goal of ours. It's not dogmatic. Um, in 2023, uh, there was one vineyard that suffered some botrytis for us, um, really close to, um, San Pablo Bay. We had some Primitivo and okay. some Sangiovese that came in. And so those grapes saw um, a small sulfur add just to kind of, just because we didn't want the botrytis to foul up the, the primary sure. fermentation and have a stuck ferment. But um, for us, getting the, getting the grapes through primary uh, and then secondary without any uh, use of sulfur enables a wide spectrum of yeast mm -hmm. and bacteria to work on your wine um, the, on both fermentations. And so you'll get sort of a wider band of aromas and flavors. Uh, and, and also like, you know, your VAs are going to creep, right? Because you're going to have, there's other bugs in there working. Mm -hmm. um, but so like the goal would never be, we would never want to release a flawed wine. I mean, so if like VA was like out of control, like it wouldn't be something we would ever put in bottle, right? If it was ever over the threshold or the limit, right? Mm -hmm. But um, what we would never, so there, there, there always are little, little flaws in wine, right? But the, yeah. for me, the, the most fatal flaw that a wine can suffer is being boring, right? Yeah. And so that's where sure. I think our, our head is at. So, so that style is sort of like yeah, blur, having the edges blur a little bit, but then also like having the structure um, for the wines to, to taste classic, you know? Mm -hmm. And like when you drink Italian wine, like it's weird, <laughs> like, you know? And so uh, particularly 
you know, from the South where, you know, economic conditions are way different than the North, right? Like when you drink Barolo, like there's like very, there's not like a lot of like zero intervention producers up in a UNESCO World Heritage site where like the stakes are high, right? Mm -hmm. Like it costs the same amount of money for fruit in Barolo that it does for like Napa Cab. So you get like a classic style, but like when you're drinking like Fiano or Catarato from Sicily and like, you know, you're getting, you're getting a variety of interpretations of stuff. So it's, yeah, so for us, it's uh, it's trying to get the wines to like land as classic as possible, but like, but being as you know, sort of having them be as as wild as possible at the same time. Yeah, do you tend to add your sulfur right after mallow finishes, or are you waiting till closer to bottling? Um, we'll we'll wait, and we'll certainly wait until mallow is done, and then sure. um, and all the wines, including the whites, all go through full secondary fermentation because we don't want to filter. Okay. Uh, so then once ML is done, we'll usually wait, um, like about a month or so the wines are still, um, there's still so much CO2 in the wines, right. That they're, yeah. they're completely inert. Uh, and then like as spring approaches, they'll get about, um, 10 to 20 parts. And that's usually enough to carry it all the way through bottling. Mm-hmm. Um, if, uh, if things, I don't like aldehydes in wine and, okay. um, and I certainly don't like mouse. And so uh, the, uh, if we see anything creeping, it'll get another 10 to 20 um, sure. before bottling. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's the, the most important thing is to, um, yeah, is to make sure that there's no, no mouse in the wine too. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's <laughs> not pleasant. No. Yeah, I love the bit of tannin on there. Yeah, touch of tannin. The wine like starts like really really like herbaceous and savory. Uh, and then as, uh, as it warms up a touch, you know, all of the, you know, the really like rich kind of like tropical fruit of Friulano comes out, you know, mm-hmm. like that sort of like real pulpy, like mango papaya, you know, it all is, it's all kind of there. It's such a unique grape variety. Can you tell me a bit about the manifesto you guys have? Yeah. Probably the first time you've ever been asked. Of- <laughs> yeah. We're the, <laughs> yeah, we're the, um, yeah, we're the, uh, the, we're the wine company that produces low intervention wine that has the Bolshevik star as its logo, right? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you'll see anti-capitalist sentiment kind of throughout all the labeling, yeah. <laughs> as well as kind of like some goofiness as well. So, um, you know, a little bit of it is, you know, my, um, it's a little bit of it is sort of like my, uh, idealism mixed with disillusionment, um, mixed with, um, you know, being equally joyous and pissed off. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you know, for, it's kind of a long answer, but, uh, for Jupiter, I think, um, to, before we get into like the manifesto, I think we should kind of talk about, um, how none of us, like myself, Mike, or my wife, like none of us wanted to kind of be put into a box. Like the last thing we wanted to do was like look at a brand name that might even be our last names or like our names or or something and just kind of like see the brand repetition like over and over and over again and just participate in conspicuous consumer capitalism. Um, It just seemed like sort of pointless. Uh, You know, I mean, obviously like, it's nice to have, it's, it's great to own a small business and, and be able to make money, but, uh, we wanted to afford ourselves, um, the opportunity to, when we create products to sort of speak where we are in relation to the world as creators. Right. Mm -hmm. And so rather than be like, Hey, here's the, here's the 2022 skin contact Frilano, which is looks and feels the same as the 2021 and the 2020 skin contact Frilano, like, it doesn't communicate, it doesn't give your consumer any transparent look into how you're, how you're doing as an artist. Right. And so, uh, we wanted to afford ourselves the opportunity to have an album cover and a track list and like mm-hmm. lyrics, like, uh, like an MC or a rock punk rock band would have. Right. And so, uh, just to be able to communicate a little bit more with our products. And so that's kind of like why they look and feel the way that they are. And like when it's funny, cause like when you, when you speak to other people in the industry, and like when like 
we line up our products and they look at it, like you can see how uncomfortable they are because they're just like, how would I communicate this brand as a marketer? You know, and it's mm-hmm. like, well, we're not asking you, so like, <laughs> we don't we don't care. And so, um, but uh, for us, like, and so we started this brand in 2020, and uh, you know, so many people were hurting. You know, a million people had died from a disease uh, that. Um, wasn't being managed well, um, or, or even even if could it could it have been managed well, right? Like it, who knows? It was it was this whole thing um, that had never really occurred in any any of our lives before, um, and you know we were very aware of agricultural workers having to work through fires, you know, mm-hmm. having to be forced to enter into evacuation zones um, without hazard pay. Um, without, you know, drinking water, access to restrooms, et cetera. And so we, we, we tried to think about, you know, what we could do to sort of launder our profits, you know, mm-hmm. like we didn't want to just sell things and make money. We wanted to sell things and make money and then sort of clean that, clean those profits before we were able to kind of actualize them. And so sort of like how, you know, an organization like Tesla can hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet for a rate of return. We said, well, why couldn't we just invest in affordable housing solutions and companies that provide affordable housing solutions on our balance sheet and seek a rate of return, you know? And once mm-hmm. we get that return, then we can move the down to the bottom line and, and kind of actualize, realize those profits, right? And so that's sort of where we kind of added this step into our business plan. Um, in terms of like having a manifesto, um, I mean, if you're a Clash fan, you'll rec- you can go on our website and see yeah. <laughs> what what it what it is, right? Um, you want you can know your rights, and so we just we thought we we wanted to like wear our our heart on our sleeve and just like let people know like this is what we this is what we stand for, right? Like because you hear about like rock star winemakers, and we didn't want to be rock star winemakers, we wanted to be punk rock winemakers, right? So like a rock star will sit, stand on stage and and pose and like tell you what they're all about and a punk rocker will tell you what they're about and what they're against. And so we were like mm-hmm. we're going to we're going to that's what we're going to do. And so uh we wanted to be really transparent about what uh we do when we make the wine, you know, what we how we think grapes should be grown how wine should be made without prescriptive prescriptive intervention. I don't think anything on there reads as dogma. I think that we afford ourselves the opportunity to make really good wine and anticipate the the all the different like vectors that could could happen to your wine, but mm-hmm. we also uh we also want to be really kind of clear what we what we stand for and most importantly was um we feel that the term sustainability should reflect um economic sustainability for the people that are responsible for growing grapes, but also um, the people that are selling wine and making wine, you know, like, you know, the, the people who are like so instrumental to the success of all of this, you know, agricultural workers, psalms, servers, tasting room employees, like none of them can afford to live in this community or even in the surrounding communities. You know, mm-hmm. my wife and I like make two good incomes and like, we barely can. And yeah. so it's like, you know, uh, there needs to be, yeah, there needs to be a, co- a bigger conversation. So if we could, what we put on our, what we put on our website is obviously provocative, but we, uh, we feel that hopefully um, it creates a larger conversation. And, um, you know, maybe um, if we're successful at doing what we do, then maybe some other folks will do the same thing. That's great. I guess it keeps you, kind of has like a little bit of a, keeps you accountable. Yeah putting it out there yeah, um, for everyone to see. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to hold us, uh, yeah, to hold us accountable, um, to keep us inspired. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think just to, you know, every, every day you ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? And yeah, I'm doing this because I believe in the following things, you know? And, um, yeah, to me, it, uh, it's equally about accountability as it is inspiration, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, looking at like starting the, the brand uh, and kind of where we've grown to um we we first started at like 375 cases of maybe not even 350 cases of wine in our first vintage and you know we just finished crushing like i think almost 1200 or 1300 cases of wine and so like okay. to see it to see folks kind of understand it um and grow despite like challenging business environment right now mm-hmm. you know with interest rates where they are you know 
with wine, the wine industry being down like 20% across the board, um, distributors backed up like 20% across the board. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're still not, we still don't even have a California distributor, um, okay. but uh, we self distributing California, um, which for us, we've, you know, turned that into, um, turn that into a positive, right? Like mm -hmm. that DIY ethos, you know, that is in that do it yourself ethos that's on our website in our manifesto. Like, yeah, like, be inspired by that, you know, and realize that like, yeah, we don't, we're not beholden to a distributor. So like, yeah, we can attack, we can attack this ourselves, you know, and do it ourselves and secure great placements in the Bay area and Southern California and, and LA and, and not have to cut anyone in. They don't want, if they don't want a part of it right now, then like, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from them, you know? And like, while they're sleeping on us, we'll, we'll put them to bed, you know, that's yeah. it. Yeah. How much do you concentrate on sort of direct to consumer versus getting the wine on uh, either shelves or, yeah. or uh, by the glass program. For us, for us right now as a startup, you know, um, I didn't want to make the same mistake that I've made in the past. And so like the, the first inclination is like, I'm going to email my mailing list and I'm going to sell it to all my friends and my family and folks that have supported me throughout the years. And like, that's like a really easy route to like sell some wine, but like, it, there's diminishing returns every time you do it, right? Mm -hmm. Unless more people are signing up for your mailing list and, and growing the brand. So we very purposefully over the first two years focus almost entirely on getting the wine on shelves, getting the wine into wine professionals' hands, getting it on restaurant wine lists, getting it by the glass and just like getting the word out to, uh, to the wine drinking world, right? And having as many advocates in the market as possible. Um, so that's been, that's been everything. And then it's just been like a, us, like as a street team, like yeah. <laughs> running uh, and hustling. Um, and it's been great. I mean, I've met so many people along the way. I mean, here I am right now talking to you um, just cause um, yeah, it just keeps, that hustle keeps growing. And so um, we're, we are distributed in um, Mike, uh, being from Las Vegas, we're, we have a, we have a Nevada distributor. And so okay. they, they do a lot of great work for us though, nice. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, well, the first time I tried one of your wines was on a, it was by the glass list and I'd, I'd heard about it, but that was, uh, that was my first tasting introduction. It really is like, you know, it's the, it's the strongest marketing campaign, right. Is to have those, those hooks out to an audience and be able to like pull people to pull people in. And then like the goal is, is that, is to make the wine as delicious as possible and as affordable as possible um, so that it becomes their favorite wine and their favorite like pizzeria or something. And then mm -hmm. like, at that point, I think like the, the work is done. Like you've, you sort of, you're just waiting at that point for then like the, the one, you know, the, that first interaction where like they either email you or make an online purchase or sign up for a wine club or sign up for your mailing list, right? Like you're just looking for that one point of contact. And then like, once you get that, once you actually have that, then, you know, it's really, I think creating a lifetime or a really long relationship with somebody then is, is, um, is, is that's the easy part, right? That's the fun part, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Is this the Montepulciano? Montepulciano. So yeah, m certainly my favorite wine to make and drink. What do you love about it? Um, what I love about it is um, it was, it's a grape that, kind of has always taken me by surprise, right? Mm. And so um, Montepulciano is a, I think it's a grape that is perennially, perennially underestimated by everyone, including in Italy, right? And so you have like a producer like Emidio Pepe that has constantly, you know, acc acclaimed how great Montepulciano is and how it's, you know, he's always mentioned how it's, it's not taken seriously. It's how it's the only red wine that he'll produce. And so every time you sort of like unwrap a Montepulciano, there's always something like really fascinating about it. Like, you know, the fact that Emilio Pepe makes these, these age-worthy, dense red wines, um, and it's usually like no sulfur winemaking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, completely no sulfur winemaking is sort of mind-boggling to me, right? Like, because I couldn't imagine like how the the wines age that gracefully how they're like that dense um how they the reds never fall apart um so to me that's always like really interesting um same thing with you know i don't i don't drink a ton of rosé but like yeah but then you like have like really good chair swallow and you're like you're like damn like this is savory and bitter and delicious 
And so again, like it just sort of like you you don't really take it seriously, and then it um, and then it it kind of wins you over. Uh, <laughs> and then lastly, like where this my love of this style came from is uh, is during uh, a couple years prior to the pandemic, like in 2017, 2018, uh, we started to see the wines from Vinny Robosco imported to the United States, and um, they make like the really serious. Like they're like, you know, a Medio Pepe, their, their skin macerated Trebbiano and their Montepulciano that's like dense and dark. But then they also produce these like really joyous table wines, like in the Flint glass, like the Bordeaux bottles. It looks like they spent like 30 cents on the packaging. <laughs> and like when you open them, they're just, it's, it's Montepulciano, but it's just like completely exuberant and built for speed and like served chilled. And it's just like, before you know it, like the, the bottle's gone in like two minutes, especially if you have like some salumi and cheese and bread and olive oil. And uh, it just is, a, it's a wine that has brought so much joy to my household um, and to alone time with my wife, uh, enjoying uh, that wine and, and just the moment that um, when we had the opportunity. So I opened this vintage, the 2020, um, which is the first vintage we made. Um, so this is probably a wine that you haven't tried. But um, the we made this sort of, it, it, it's really interesting. We we were gonna get Montepulciano mm -hmm. and we uh, we hadn't called our pick yet on Fox Hill. And Evan Landowski, of Ruth Landowski, he was gonna pick some Montepulciano. And so he picked these grapes and he crushed them. You know, he like gently tread on them with his feet. And he uh, he said, he, he, he sent them in for chemistry and he realized he's like, ooh, he's like, He's like, I was going to try to make like, you know, a, a richer red wine. He's like, I think I picked okay. these grapes too early. He's like, he's like, what are you doing with your Montepulciano? I was like, well, I, I was like, I want it to be like really crunchy. I was like, I'm going to press it on four days. I'm essentially going to make like, it's going to be like a white wine almost, yeah. right? Um, I was like, I, I sort of like Robosco, you know, presses at like 72 to 96 hours. And he's like, he should, he's like, go taste that juice. And so I tasted it. I was like, yeah, I was like, this is what I'm looking for. And so, uh, yeah, so I ended up just taking Evan's Montepulciano and then Evan picked my Montepulciano okay. like two weeks later. <laughs> just a little swap. Uh, <laughs> you know, a little swap. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, and it was, uh, it, it turned out delightful and exactly how I like. And what I love is that when you make, and you'll see, you, you see these like Rosso, these IGT Rosso wines from Abruzzo now that are um, of Montepulciano. And they just like scream like red cherry, but then all of the like kind of carob, um, carob chip sort of like cocoa nib notes of Montepulciano are, are kind of all there in the background in this like kind of feral way as well. So the wine to me is like super crushable, but then also at the same time, like gives you a little bit of that complexity. Yeah, it seems like it would go with just about any, any food. And yeah, I love the, has the, the tannin coming yeah, I mean, I said that about the other one also, but it's a little unexpected and I think it's great though. It just makes it that much more robust and I, I think to pair with a wider range of foods. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, what's really unexpected is that that communicates like tannin like that after 96 hours mm -hmm. on the skins, right? So there is like no active fermentation. It's not like these have, there's no alcohol to extract any tannin right. present, you know, like, cause usually most of your tannin extraction like happens sort of on the, on the tail end of the fermentation when they're, the alcohol as a solvent is really working on those skins and stems mm -hmm. and seeds and stuff. But uh, yeah, this is just like cold extraction for like 96 hours and like, yeah, you get, yeah, you get, it's pretty chewy, um, but at the same time, like juicy and mouth watering yeah. and yeah, ready for, yeah, a, a wide a wide variety of of foods, but also like just salty, fatty, yummy stuff too. Mm -hmm. Have you continued to make it in the similar way, four days or so on yeah. the skins? And so uh, 2020, 2021, uh, were made in that style. Uh, 2023, uh, which is still in in vessel out, obviously, mm -hmm. um, is uh, is has been made in that style. 2022 is a was a very difficult year on Fox Hill. Okay. Uh, you know, like fifth or sixth year into a historic drought cycle. And then 2022 punctuated by like massive heat spikes, right. like big 10, 12 day, like 110 degree heat spike. And so we brought the Montepulciano in after, you know, there was a pretty big, it got really hot up there and essentially the whole canopy got roasted off mm. of the vine. Um, so like all of the, 
leaves were burned off after the heat. The fruit was still intact and not um, raisined at all, but but not very ripe, right? Okay. So like, you know, really high acid, um, not a lot of like phenolic development. And so we brought it in and we we sort of like made like, uh, sort of like a rosado sparkling wine base okay. out of it. And so there'll be some fizzy Montepulciano. It's the, the bubbles are being made right now. So. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we um, will, um, yeah, we'll, we have a method ancestral of uh, a Montepulciano coming soon. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, like the the goal was to make glue glue, but with um, but with grapes that are you know really structured, and so you get mm-hmm. like the the fun the fun to drink side, but then also a little of the charm of that of that backbone of structure, you know, that I'm always seeking at the same time. Yeah, Do you age that in stainless or uh, everything in- is aged in uh, fiberglass. Fiberglass, okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is um, so we bring the fruit in. Uh, whole bunches of Montepulciano and we foot tread it pretty well in uh, like a, in a tea bin, you know? Mm-hmm. And then uh, after about four days, we'll um, load it into a basket press and uh, basket press some vintages. If we have a, a higher volume, we'll, that'll, that will actually fit into a larger pneumatic press. We'll use that. Okay. And then, um, and then it gets pressed in a fiberglass. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then fermented entirely off skins. Um, and then, uh, aged on all of the, you know, all the gross leaves uh, until the spring. So usually around like May or June, we'll really gently rack off those solids and then um, allow it to clarify one time before we bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No fining, no filtration ever on the wines. Right. Yeah. So for us, like you'll never see a Jupiter wine that, you know, like currently in March, like you see a ton of 2023 rosés and aromatic whites and stuff on the market. And, mm-hmm. you know, for us, like the, those wines in the cellar still, like they just finished ML, they're still pretty turbid and cloudy. And yeah. so like, I don't want to find, I don't want to have to find them with Bent Knight or any other finding agent. And I certainly don't want to have to filter them. It just seems like a, it seems like a process. I, and I'm not speaking ill of anyone that chooses to filter their wines, but like for us, like um, we just think that the patience and the time, uh, the extra time and the patience rewards you with uh, the opportunity to um, have an unfiltered wine. And for yeah. us, the wines have so much acid, always, they're Thai grape varieties. So like the wines are always ripping with acidity. And so having the wine be unfiltered, we think provides a better drinking experience. That's why we choose to do it um, because it it provides a little bit more mouthfeel, a little mm-hmm. bit more flesh um, to sort of counteract that acidity. If this wine was filtered um, and didn't have, you know, that, t- that additional texture, like it might be a little shrill, right? And so yeah. um, for us, like, yeah, the balance is there. Um, it's not not a dogma, right? Like ultimately, if the wine is like really dank and, and dirty, like, of course, we're going to filter it. But uh, but the choice is always to try to make that, try to give you that balance and that drinking experience. Yeah, there's so many rosés. I, I think that they just drink better the next year. Uh, you yeah. Know, and they get bottled kind of early, but even just waiting a, well, another year for us sense. like our rosado i don't have it open right now but you might have tried it at the fox hill tasting our rosado of negramaro um spends about five days on skins and stems goes through like a really long ferment really long ml and um yeah like we we choose to bottle no finding no filtration negramaro has a ton of acid has a ton of tannin um and so we choose to bottle that unfiltered. So like, it's usually not until like August is that wine like really like clarified and settled out. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like we we actually bottle it as non-vintage because okay. um, yeah, just cause we just don't want to deal with the market telling us that, oh yeah, we don't want to sell rosé that's, we don't want to sell a vintage rosé that's, you know, six months old or a year old or whatever. And, but like we're, the wine is made as if it were, you know, a red wine, you know? Yeah. So like, we kind of like, we want, we, we take the, the time and the patience to, to create, you know, that, that drinking experience. And so like, yeah, we just like try to like make it easier for the market to take it on too. Yeah. So you feel like you actually have less pushback with the non-vintage yeah. than with the vintage Absolutely. Date? Okay. Yeah. No one asks. And That's so, really interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. And so, uh, yeah, I think, um, but then also like the, 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 the account that is asking that question is likely not, you know, a good venue for our wines. So, but it's always, um, it's always a single vintage. 
Yeah. Uh, just with the- our Not first vintage. Our or? first vintage was a single vintage. Our second vintage has, uh, yeah, we've started to like blend back a little bit. Oh, you have? Too. Okay. Yeah. So, to, well, not since it's NV, we're able to yeah. yeah afford ourselves the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like it just gives it like a little more sort of mid palate to it? Mid palate. Yeah. Mid palate depth. Um, yeah. Just uh, the level, the wine just becomes longer. Yeah. What do you think the aging capability of it is? You, you think it's something that can. I think Keep kind of I think like short out. I think like or, short to medium term right like I would say like yeah I would want to drink it in like 3 to 5 years you know but um but certainly not a rush there's there's quite a bit of tannin there's quite a bit of acid you know a, a ton of fruit so yeah you have the you have the three components to sort of go a little bit a little bit longer than 12 months right mm-hmm. yeah so like the skin contact friolano um sort of a, a touch more serious wine. You know, we were known for producing some, uh, some really joyous, um, easy to drink stuff, but then, um, you know, to tell the full story, you know, you want to, you want to produce some wines that have a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, a little bit more of a serious side. And so, uh, this is, um, uh, a carbonic co-ferment, uh, Schiava and Lagrine. So made, uh, like some of my favorite wines from the Sutral, um, San Magdalena, where um, the wines are, those wines are usually 50 to 70, 80% Schiava. Uh, the Schiava block in this vintage was really young and didn't produce much. So this is about 70% Lagrin, okay, and then 30% Schiava. Uh, we brought the grapes in and uh, got them into uh, a vessel, sealed them up with carbon dioxide, added dry ice every day, for about um, about 13 days. So about okay. 13 days carbonic on that. And then uh, popped the lids off and, uh, you know, tasted the juice, kind of how like lifted it was from from that carbonic maceration and then tread with our feet and then allowed, um, you know, conventional fermentation um, uh, uh, while these Saccharomyces to kind of take over. Mm-hmm. To finish it off, yeah. Is this Fox Hill? Uh, here, this or? is Las Cimas. Las Cimas, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of get the carbonic at the beginning and then yeah and it's also into the yeah and with the fuller body yeah exactly like the when you look at it you know the the wine is dense and dark and and purpley right from the lagrin mm-hmm. but uh the moment you taste it right it lifted mouth watering i'm having trouble actually talking right now because my mouth is watering <laughs> so much yeah but uh it's um and really savory um it's sort of like smells and tastes like it kind of crawled out of the woods, right? It's mm-hmm. like very Alpine um, in style and flavor and aroma. Uh, yeah, certainly a, uh, it's a wine that I love. Uh, we were able to make it again in 2022. Actually some volume of it, it uh, this Giava and the Lagrine picked really heavy in 2022. Okay. And so it's like, we're actually able to like scale this like really weird wine. So it's, yeah, we're, hopefully it finds a wider audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe not everybody's first, choice for their like a wider released yeah, wine right. <laughs> when i say wider release too it's just going to be a couple hundred cases not mm-hmm. like nothing we produce is huge i guess you might you, you might be a little biased but what do you think the future of italian varieties is in california because i, I feel like some of really like vermentino for example its popularity is just like skyrocketed the yeah. last 10 years, but maybe in the last like four or five, just off the charts. And it seems to do super well in, in California. Yeah. Um, and with climate change and. Yeah. So I think it, it goes, <clears throat> goes back to earlier what I said. It's like, you know, where, like, take a look around you and ask yourself, like, where does this feel like, you know, like, where in the world that grows great wine does Northern California feel like, right? And so when you like walk around vineyards in Northern California, you know, you're, you can smell the, the lavender and the rosemary and the sage, right? Mm-hmm. You're likely flanked on both sides of the vineyard by like olive groves, right? Doesn't feel like France. It doesn't feel yeah. like, oh, well, it doesn't feel like Atlantic climate, Bordeaux and Burgundy, right? right. It doesn't feel like Loire really, right? And so um, that to me sort of speaks volumes, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, you, I think that what we have right here 
that sort of subtropical Mediterranean climate here in Northern California, like speaks to, you know, a lot of the grape varieties of Italy. Mm -hmm. Um, Vermentino grows really well here. Vermentino grows as well here as it does uh, in Liguria and Sardinia and, and Tuscany. We make some incredibly noble ex examples of Vermentino here in California. Um, the work that Sam's done at Idaho Wild shows, you know, that Piedmontese grape varieties grown at elevation in Northern California, particularly Mendocino, um, do really well. Uh, Fox Hill um, sh kind of has shown us that like, certainly the middle of Italy for Jupiter, like Sangiovese and Montepulciano grow is exceptionally well and variety correct here. I think, um, so do I think that the future of California viticulture is going to include, you know, these Italian grape varieties because of how suited they are to grow here and the quality of wines they make. Like, yeah, that, that's an easy yes. Like, um, what I find interesting though is, um, cause so much of what I deal with here in like working and living in Healdsburg and other projects that I've consulted on is, you know, nine to nine and a half out of 10 people that come to this region, like to drink wine, like want to drink Pinot Noir, want to drink Chardonnay, want to drink Cabernet Sauvignon, et cetera. And so I think the biggest challenge is going to be like breaking through to them uh, and, you know, sort of winning their trust, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where, uh, that's where I think like the big, the big challenge is. And so that's, uh, that's a whole other, a whole other question. But I think that the, the market is certainly growing for them as well for, you know, these Italian grape varieties in, in Northern California. So yeah, I'm definitely biased because I produce them, but also, um, I think that, uh, I think that they're better suited to grow here. I think that that's definitely, I don't think, I know that's in our manifesto as well. <laughs> it's like, it's like what, and that was just part of, you know, me having a chip on my shoulder, like from like being so disillusioned, you know, for the first 10 years that I learned to make wine, it was like, oh yeah, we grow Pinot Noir here. And like, we, you know, the, 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 from like producers that from, from the producers that we really respect and admire in the industry from like, you know, the historic, the historic producers of the Russian river, you know, the adage is like, you can add acid, but you can't add flavor. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like all the fruit that would come in was like pushing four pH and had like, you know, four TA mm -hmm. and like, it was like, <laughs> what is, yeah. And so you're just like dumping bags of tartaric acid into it. So like, yeah, for me, that was like, that was not, that wasn't an option anymore. Like I just didn't want to do it. And so, yeah. uh, so that, uh, that to me, what I'm constantly amazed with growing Italian grape varieties in Northern California, whether it be Schiava and La Grind, Montepulciano, Frilano, Vermentino, Bianchetta, is I'm not, I'm never looking at bricks at harvest. I'm never measuring sugars. Okay. You know, it's, I'm always looking for acid. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, the, you're always looking for pH and the, the, when the the acids have ripened to a certain point and the pH has risen to a certain point where it, like it stalls and then it and then it starts to rise again that's when you grab it and you're going to be your sugars are magically there right i mean right. like we'll we'll check we we obviously check bricks at that time but it's never an issue it's never like we need to we need to wait mm -hmm. like whereas like you would you would look at your your acids with Pinot Noir and a lot of the warmer climates here in the Russian river. And like, you know, you would taste the fruit and you would never consider picking it. You're like, we need to wait. Like, you know, there's, yeah. You know, like, so it's like, yeah, there's no, there's no balance. Uh, there, the, the, oftentimes there's no balance. Whereas mm -hmm. with the Italian grape varieties, like there's this, there's this balance and this kind of harmony um, with the grapes and the vineyard and the environment um, even with the heat stress. And yeah. so that to me uh, shows, that to me, in my opinion, means that the right thing is planted there. Because mm -hmm. you're not having to like, am I allowed to curse on this? Or yeah, no? yeah. There's, yeah, there's, yeah, no, yeah. there's no fuckery in the cellar, yeah. you know? So it's <laughs> like, that's to me uh, would, be, uh, would be the sign that like you got the right thing planted there. Yeah, and I mean, this area has been compared to Italy by immigrants for a long time. I mean, going back to the, early Italian immigrants of yeah. this area, mo mostly Northern Italian, but mm -hmm. um, Italian Swiss colony and just up the road, 
things like that. I mean, there's a reason a lot of yeah. them ended up here. Italian Swiss colony. Yeah. Well, I mean, Italian Swiss colony and then Northern Italy, right? Piedmont. Um, and then particularly, um, uh, Piedmont Lombardy, um, but that particularly Fruli and, um, the area of Italy that's now known as Croatia at the time, like, uh, they all emigrated here as my, they were miners mm -hmm. um, for the gold rush, right? And yeah. so they brought their they brought the, their sticks with them, you know. And the Sierra foothills ended up with you know really old vine Barbera and Zinfandel, right? As yeah. a as a result, and uh, and then when the gold rush panned out, um, those immigrants came to this area where we're sitting right now and put their sticks in the ground and um, started to quarry stone in the Russian River um, to build San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have, you know, the legacy of a lot of those grape varieties that were grown here, but also like Southern California, like mm -hmm. Cucamonga Valley. Yeah. Um, and like we're in like in the Inland Empire, Cucamonga Valley, like, you know, they're the largest contiguous vineyard in the world was there yeah. around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, planted to Piedmontese grape varieties, varietal bottled Grignolino, Frasia, Ruque. Like you see like on Instagram, these old bottles that pop up from uh, the Italian grape company or IGC. Um, or, Italian Vineyard Company? Yeah, I IBC, think, the Italian yeah. Vineyard Company, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's yeah. like, you see it and you're just like, you're yeah. like, yeah, like, so <laughs> it, it was all here. Um, and it, it made sense then, mm -hmm. it makes sense now, I think. Um, yeah, we're, um, and this goes back to my, you know, my, my early days as an economist uh, in college, right? It's, uh, you know, what we have right now is, is economic path dependence, right? It's called the economics of QWERTY, right? Like if you look at mm. the keyboard in front of you, like why are the keys arranged in a way that like make your fingers numb and your like <laughs> hands like ache? It's because like it was arranged to slow down your typing mm. with mm -hmm. the typewriter. Because if you type too fast, the keys would lock up. And you have to unseparate them and like fix the big mess that was uh, in front of you. And so people learn to type on this very inefficient system and it persists today. There is a much more um, healthy, um, ergonomic and efficient way to arrange keys on a keyboard, but we don't do it. There is a much more healthy, sustainable way to plant Northern California, but here we are, right? <laughs> We're on economic, an inefficient economic path dependence. And so I think that's... Um, that's where we're, that's where we're at. Um, and so, but the good news is, is that, um, the things are, things are changing and mm -hmm. just to, to see the interest in our wines, um, is a, a, a really good, a really good, uh, really good sign, um, to see the interest in the Idaho wild wines, you know, over the last five years, as I've been mm -hmm. working with this, with Sam on this brand, it, um, has been, uh, has been eye opening, you know? Yeah. And so it's for us, like it, it's the only, it's the only way forward, you know, mm -hmm. like, you're never gonna, you're never gonna retire early in this industry. This isn't this isn't tech or software yeah. or, or or what name that, and or anything like that. Or it's it you know you you surround you do this to surround yourself with the products and the people that bring you joy, mm -hmm. and uh, and you do it until the end. And mm -hmm. like that's uh, and so I think that seeing that there's a path forward with the things that the products that we love and then the people that are attracted to them that bring us, that will obviously bring us joy um, is, uh, is, is to me really reassuring and makes me happy. So, yeah. What do you think is next for Jupiter? Um, what do I think is next for Jupiter? Or what do you know is next? <laughs> That's okay um, too. <laughs> what do I think is next for Jupiter? Well, I think um, for us, um, now that we've established, um, now that we've established ourselves in Northern California and have broken into Southern California, and uh, I think for us uh, is to really shift towards direct to consumer. Okay, you know we've, I think we've um, won uh, a lot of goodwill from a lot of folks that we've met along the way over the last like two three years, and so I think now we're gonna you know really focus on direct to consumer. We're um, working with, uh, with a friend, um, uh, to potentially open up a tasting room and, and kind of be involved in something a little bit bigger, okay. uh, as well. And so for us, it's really exploring that, that next layer, right. Of, mm -hmm. uh, of content to kind of bring context to it all. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think, uh, if I could like thank, thank some folks, you know, um, yeah. I think, uh, 
you know, obviously, you know, Jupiter wouldn't exist without, you know, the nurturing environment that, you know, Idlewild and Sam has provided us. Um, the understanding um, of my wife, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the friendship of Mike, you know, that to really support all the weird ideas that come to us, you know, and, and kind of just jump in and, yeah, be one of the Dukes of Hazard for sure. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, obviously, the generosity um of, you know, uh, Ryan and Megan, you know, to help us, you know, acquire Vermentino, that first vintage. Um, uh, Evan Lindowski um, is, uh, you know, I, I say it constantly and uh, I don't think he ever wants to hear it. He's a super consequential winemaker um, of our generation. You know, um, I think that, um, I think that he doesn't accept that role yet. But I mean, I think he's going to go down in history as that. Um, I also um, don't think anyone realizes how good of a teacher he is. Um, mm. I, I ask a lot of questions at the winery, you know, because it's that collaborative environment. So like, you know, Jen Reichart from Raft is there and Mike D, um, Mike D is our associate winemaker at Idlewild. And so he's got an enormous amount of, you know, production experience from uh, Radio Coteau and Sam is there and, Ryan and Megan used to be there, but like when you ask Evan, like I would ask everyone the same question just to hear the different answers. And mm -hmm. like the answers that you get from Evan are like very thoughtful and long um, okay. and considerate. Uh, and, um, and also like um, rooted in a lot of experience. I mean, mm -hmm. he traveled the world. Um, he traveled the world uh, working with a number of different biodynamic producers. And so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's just, um, yeah, he's a, he's a really, he's just an enormous, I'm, I'm probably, now he's going to probably be overwhelmed with people like DMing him and stuff now, but like, <laughs> he's just got an enormous amount of, of knowledge and he's got a really um, unique um, thorough way of, of sharing all that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. And, and uh, thank my folks too, for really encouraging me to move out here like almost 20 years ago and, you know, just kind of pursue this, this weird life that I have. Yeah. So yeah, it's, um, yeah. So that's a, uh, that's it. Nice. Uh, what's the best place for people to get your wines or follow Jupiter? Or yeah, um, we're not like incredibly active on social media. Like I try not to participate in the downfall of democracy and, <laughs> um, you know, the mental health, you know, terrors of, you know, teenage girls and et cetera. So Understandably. I, we're, 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 we, we'll, we'll post some, some, some pithy things on there occasionally, but um, certainly our website, uh, jupiterwineco.com. Um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, if we're not on your, on the shelf of your favorite bottle shop or by the glass at your like favorite little spot, just like, you know, just ask for us to be there, um, and, um, tell them to reach out to us and we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it there for sure. Thanks for listening to the conversation with Thomas. Jupiter is a relatively new winery, but making great wines while also trying to give something back. I especially love the Tokai Frulano and the Montepulciano. It'll be fun to watch them grow and evolve even more. You can find the wines at jupiterwineco.com and follow them on Instagram at jupiterwineco. You can follow the podcast on wherever you're listening and the Instagram at IndieWinePodcast. And feel free to email IndieWinePodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or feedback. If you could tell your wine friends about the podcast too, even just one of them, and help spread the word, I'd really appreciate it. Rating or subscribing helps too. There is also a Patreon if you choose to support the podcast monetarily to allow for more episodes and to help defray other costs. Any amount is appreciated. The link is in the show notes. We now have a small token of our appreciation to send to you also. We'll be back soon with another episode. Have a good one.